Billy Collins is a poet laureate. In a poem that he titled Detail, he invites us to sit in a room with a woman who is looking at what he says was a very expensive book on a coffee table. She was passing through the portraits of people and places that she should know, but doesn't. She leaves through the book, looking at the various pictures, and then comes across a photo of clouds in the sky. She doesn't realize that that photo is a detail, an enlargement, one small section of a much larger printing. Her eyes rest on that page, and then she looks up and says, this one is my favorite. She doesn't know that it's just a detail. But what she does know is that those clouds in her eyes are beautiful. And for her, on this day, as Billy Collins writes, that was enough. I thought about this poem as I prepared for my message here on Job chapter 14. Job 14 is a section of scripture that is filled with intense darkness and death. And yet there is a small part, one detail that is amazingly beautiful. And for us, on this day, it is enough. Over the past month, we have been studying the book of Job. And you probably by now know the plot of Job. Job was a wealthy and happy man. Until one day Satan comes before God and says that the only reason that Job has faith is because God, you're bribing him with all his blessings. Satan bets God that if he would remove his blessings, that Job would curse God. So God gives permission to Satan to do what he wants to Job, except he cannot take his life. Gone are jo is Job's wealth, estimated to be about 45 million in today's currency. Even worse, killed are all his children, all 10 of them. And to make matters totally miserable, Job is afflicted with boils and sores that cover his entire body. Think of the worst case of chicken pox. But the pox aren't just little BB-sized poxes, but dime-sized poxes from which pus and blood ooze. He is in pain constantly, and his looks are hideous. So wretched is his looks that people can't stand to be around him. So considering his situation, it's no wonder that at the beginning of Job here, he is very pointed in his description of human life. He is as blunt as a baseball bat. Job says, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. And then, a few verses later, he laments, man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Job is at the end of his rope. He had it all and lost it all. And now he is absolutely overwhelmed with darkness and death. But then, in the midst of the storm, Job says, there is hope for a tree. 
What? Really? Hope for a tree? Did you catch that detail? Did you catch that small little detail as you were reading through this section in preparation for today's sermon? Did you catch that detail? And did it strike you as incongruent with the rest of Job's darkness and depression and focus on death? There is hope for a tree? And yet, this small part, this one little detail is absolutely beautiful. And for us, on this day, this detail is enough. Understand what Job is saying. He said, if you cut it down, it will sprout again, and the shoots will not fail. Job was not only cut down by successive massive uh, tragedies, his animals, his crops, his servants, his family, his own health, but we also understand that he was cut down deliberately by other people. More than likely, you know what that's like. There are people in your life that have taken an ax and tried to chop you down through their words, through their accusations, through physical intimidation or outright lies. Chop, chop, chop. Children are bullies. Teenagers are cyber bullies. They can be. Bosses can be bullies. Spouses can chop at their, uh, at their spouses through, other, for, through constant criticism. People have taken an ax to your reputation. Chop, chop, chop. They're trying to cut you down. Cut you down to size. And so did Job's friends, his so-called friends, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. They chopped at him. They cut him down. They were a lot like Deborah Ricketts. Who's Deborah Ricketts? Deborah Ricketts is an independent researcher for the film industry. She makes it her job to point out mistakes. Like, if, you're, if your movie is set in the 1930s, you can't have a person reading a newspaper that didn't exist at that time. Nor can you have a song playing that hadn't yet been written. She points out mistakes, such as in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It had, India, it had a map that charted Indiana Jones' flight over Thailand. You catch the problem there? The movie was set in 1936. In 1936, Thailand was still called Siam. It didn't become Thailand until 1939. In the movie Die Hard 2, Bruce Willis, in a scene, is making a phone call from a pay phone in a booth in Washington, D.C. But neither the director, nor the set designer, nor any of the film editors know, noticed that the phone booth, phone booth had written on it, Pacific Bell. Oops. Deborah Ricketts lives to find mistakes. So did Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, and so do some people in our lives. They had the bedside manner of a drill sergeant and the compassion of a chainsaw killer. A revised version of their theology might go something like this. Boy, Job, you must have been really bad. We know God is good, and if these bad things are happening to you, you must have been really bad. No wonder in chapter 16, 
Job calls them miserable comforters. His head aches, his eyes burn, his legs ache, and he is sick and tired of their hollow homilies. Yet, there is hope for a tree. How often in the midst of trouble and uh, turmoil in your life has someone said something similar to you or at least suggested it by what they said, you know, like, well, how did you get yourself in this situation? Or um, is there something that you need to confess? What did you do to cause this? Even worse is when we accuse ourselves. When we say, well, God's punishing me for something. I don't maybe not know what it is, but he's obviously punishing me for some reason. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, our sinful human ego has tried to come up with lines of reasoning, lines of argument to try to justify ourselves, you know, to at least have some way that we can earn a, a part of our salvation. You know, we say things like, well, God stalks me on the path, but I still have to live a good life. Eh, wrong. I have to make a decision for Christ. Uh, wrong again. Or something like, say something like, um, um, God gave me this faith because he knew I would believe. Eh, wrong again. And if the ego is so good at trying to self-justify ourselves, then you know that that ego is going to blame yourself too when something goes wrong. That ego is going to say, God is punishing you for some reason, bud. But most of the time, we don't have to say for some reason. Most of the time, we know the reason that God is punishing us. That's why the words of Job are so important to us. There is hope for a tree. A tree can overcome being left for dead. When sin, Satan, and our own guilty consciousness tries to beat our spirit and leaves it dead, Job's words become words of renewal to us. He says, its roots may grow old in the ground and its stump die in the soil. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. Job was left for dead. First by the accuser, Satan, who said that his faith was nothing but a farce. Second by his wife, who told him to curse God and die. And then third by his miserable comforters, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. If there is hope for a tree, there is hope for me. Job says, I will, be, I will have renewal when it comes. That's what he says in verse 14. And that noun for renewal comes from the same Hebrew word for which the verb of a tree growing from a stump comes from, which indicates to us that this word renewal means Job has hope. He claims renewal in the midst of darkness and death. And even if, and all that from that single, solitary, insignificant little shoot that comes up from the stump of a tree. One small part, one small detail. It's beautiful. And for us, on this day, it is enough. Otto Dix is a German painter who knows the power of a small detail. Dix was a German soldier during World War I. World War I was all about trench warfare and the advent of chemical weapons, phosgene and mustard gas. A person who would breathe in those gases would 
essentially drown in the secretions that it caused in their lungs. It was a horrific sight. Otto was wounded in battle and after the war was over was given the Iron Cross. But no medal, no honor, no talk of glory in battle could erase his horrific memories. So he painted. Otto Dix composed what was known as the war triptych. He styled it after the triptychs that adorned the altars above the great in the great cathedrals of Europe. Typically, in the middle triptych there, you would have an image or painting of the crucifixion of Christ, and on the either side panels, you would have either the two thieves or uh, the, his mother Mary, the disciples, saints, or angels. But Otto turned that upside down. Instead of the story of God and the image of salvation, he painted the story of humanity and images of war. In the center where the crucifixion uh, should be, he painted the remnants of war, the war to end all wars. The only living thing in the picture is a man wearing a gas mask because the air is poisoned, not only with gases, but with the stench of death. But into that painting, he adds a detail, a small detail. At the top of the painting, you'll see the remnants of a bridge. Stretched out on that bridge is a corpse. Stretched out from the corpse is an arm. Stretched out from that arm is one bony finger. Follow that finger and there you'll find him, buried upside down among other corpses. Jesus beaten up by the world, discarded, defeated, dead, and buried. Like a tree, Jesus too was cut down and left for dead. Yet in the midst of history's darkest and most deadly moment, there is hope. Hope in the tree of the cross because there Jesus took on the world's sin and wretchedness our sin and wretchedness there on the cross Jesus vanquishes the wages of sin death itself on the tree of the cross our loneliness our rejection and our pain is taken on by Jesus he takes on himself our punishment, the punishment that we deserve. And in its place, he gives us his blood, his precious blood, blood that causes life to sprout, blood that brings renewal through forgiveness and restoration. And to make sure that you and I understand that there is still hope for a tree, There it is. Hope for a tree. Jesus springs to life in three days. Jesus, from the stump of his body, life springs forth. The one who was crucified, dead and buried, is now alive forever, and he will never Fail. Jesus' resurrection is our assurance that God can and will give life. Give life to those who in faith put their trust in Him. And finally, 
That's why Job can say, there is hope for a tree. And that's why we, no matter how tormented we are, no matter how broken our lives seem, even if death is hovering over our front doorstep, even for us, we can say, if there is hope for a tree, there is hope for me. That detail, a sprout from the stump, is beautiful, and it is enough. It is always and forevermore enough. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.